Let's start anyway with folklore and the pagan and the Mari Lloyd. What do we know about this? Well, it's Welsh tradition of going around houses at Christmas time with a horse's skull decorated with ribbons and things and singing outside people's houses. And there's a kind of question and answer, sing along. Kind of a bit like, oh, yes, he did. Oh, no, he didn't. Yeah, yeah. I think it's called a punko, which sounds like a great name for a band, actually. Absolutely. Uh, So it's this horse's skull and it's decorated and it looks pretty massive in quite a lot of photos, doesn't it? And it's quite scary or cartoony almost. Is it pagan in its roots? Is it Christian? I think there's a, a strand in, is it Samhain or Halloween tradition of yeah. a horse meaning death, isn't mm. there? Yeah, there's a lot of horse folklore in Welsh mythology generally and kind of an otherworldliness if you think of Rhiannon and how she's represented as a horse in the other world. And yes. Things. But for me, it's this kind of ever-present death, this skull, but it kind of snaps away and celebrates. It's kind of we find these kind of reasons to celebrate in the dark times and kind of dress it up. And Yeah. I mean, it sounds like quite a shouty thing. Yeah. And also, reading a bit about horses' heads, I think they've been used as symbols of fertility. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they'll put outside women's houses as a message of contempt. Yeah. But what it makes me think of, more than anything else, is the godfather and the horse's head in the bed. Yeah. Which is pretty, about as sinister as you can get, really. Okay, well, you know, we could spend all day with the pagans, actually, because there were some other... Christmas traditions in Wales, weren't there? There was Kalenig, which is going round and asking for money. Mm. And in some places, they threaten people by squirting water, which sounds a bit of a laugh, actually. Yeah. I would have quite liked to do yeah. that. Maybe do a revival. I'll um, do that this afternoon. Yeah, well, mm. well, you could stand outside a pub, couldn't you, with a big sort of water jet? Yeah. And the homing, which is a bit sort of Sadistic. So the last person to get up on Christmas morning gets beaten by holly branches, yep. mm. each to their own. <laughs> but some people might quite like that. And then there's toffee or taffy making. Yeah, that still feels quite familiar, doesn't it? The kind of yes, cooking of sweets and yeah, like stir it up yeah. Saturday or whatever they call it on Saturday. Yeah. Stir it up Saturday. And do you want to introduce your poem and give us a little bit of background to it, please? Okay. So my poem comes back to the idea of folklore and mythology and this tradition of Hunt the Wren, which is, again, when people went from house to house carrying a long pole with, like, a a birdcage on the end of it where they had a wren that they'd caught and would just go around singing songs... And for me, that encapsulated what we've been talking about this whole time, about life being captured in a place Mm. and how we kind of make a big song and dance trying to celebrate this time. And I started thinking about how the wren, this tiny little bird, encapsulates all life trapped over winter and um, the kind of panic and flurry of of trying to make the best of it and escape. So that's what got me going. Yeah. Okay, let's hear it. Hunt the Wren Let's put it in a box, this tiny thing, this bone, this beak, this feather, this wing, this grit, this voice, this light, this flight, this panic of life kept swaddled up tight in a rainbow of ribbons, a shower of stars, a warm winter wassail dissolving the shards that pierce all resolve and sear in reverse, form crystals in blood cells, dividing to fear. It hardens to diamond, ground down to dust, a snowflake, settle, and ice to a crust. 
It levels the land in silent perfection, but the song of the wren breaks out. Resurrection. That is great, I love it. Can we hear your response, Bob? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, so I wrote this on Friday night, which was extremely stormy here. And I'm very interested in sort of paranoia and people watching each other and bad things like that. I started to think about what it would be like if the Maori really returned and what would they do? And I have to say, this is quite an attractive proposition to me. It could be something to do in the middle of Pembrokeshire during the winter months. So this is called The Return of the Maori, and it is very much based on the Vernon Watkins extract that I read earlier. World end, world end, world end, world end. Listen to the blast and the blow. Yes, you'll say you deserve such a pile, but we've been watching you for a while. Gas guzzler, lights on, fast food in hot tub, emit and kill between here and golf club. We've no choice now but to fight tribe with tribe, though we don't like such a threatening vibe. Our horse heads are ready, our rat bags full, we're here to evict you, it's push now, not pull. World end, world end, world end, world end, listen to the blast and the blow. Thank you, Emma, and a dolly clown to you all.